Welcome back to the Product Design Report, a show about what's going on in the world of product design and why it matters. I'm Taylor, and I'm joined here by Jordan, and we're the makers of UX Tools. Our first segment is Under the Hood, where we discuss real work done by product design teams. So the story that we're talking about today is written by um, Jenny Nadler on Medium. She's on the Wix UX team. And she wrote a really interesting article about how they kind of refactored their error messages. She said that they kind of had a wake up call in 2021. They realized that their error messages weren't that great. And so they decided to look through all of their content management system and find any areas where they use the word error and um, basically try to refactor, rewrite and redesign their error messages says that they found 7,643 pieces of content. So this is quite a huge project. Yeah, we. I think we've come across so many blog posts and pieces of content that, you know, try and give some simple formula to writing an error message or try and tell you what you should and shouldn't do. But like, Ginny here has worked with 7,000, you know, pieces of text. And I, and I think her article really shows the depth and amount of work that she did and, and was able to create kind of a framework and a system to review those and write those and a uh, really, really cool thing to do. So if anyone out there is currently doing any UX writing, this is a great resource to put in your tool belt. Yeah, she goes over some really great stuff. She talks about what makes a bad error message, what makes a good one. She talks about what they learned as a team and how they're going to change moving forward. And, you know, I think that I've written an article actually for UX tools about how error messages are really important. And... This is a really excellent article with real practical value, so it's definitely worth a look. Next up, Have You Heard, where we cover product announcements and new releases. One that you may have seen pop up in Figma just over the past couple weeks is they now have a Command F or Control F function where you can find and rename things just all through that menu. Um, and it makes it so much easier to travel through your design files and find those messy layers. Uh, so check that one out. Yeah, and yesterday, Figma on their Twitter account announced uh, several awesome new features that they just dropped. So the first one is music in Fig Jam. It gives you a couple different like channels that you can play, which is really cool. They have voting in Fig Jam, which in my opinion um, is a long time coming. It should have it should have been one of the first releases, I think, with how teams use Fig Jam. But I mean, it's great that they've added that. They also took sections from Fig Jam and now added them to Figma, which I think is really great for organizing your boards. And then finally, now they have mobile comments. So you can review, you know, they have their mobile app and you can review designs and now leave feedback. Yeah, some of these features we've seen in other whiteboarding tools, you know, as we've maintained the design tools database and stuff, but it's nice to see Fig Jam catching up. Um, definitely, definitely some nice things to use there. And my team is already chatting about um, using music <laughs> For some of the stuff we do so that's fun and the last one we've got here is actually a plugin uh the figma auto name plugin this one will actually rename your layers for you which is driven by artificial intelligence which is kind of a crazy thing to see yeah i don't know if you guys uh, um name all your layers i don't usually <laughs> i it kind of depends on the project i guess and basically if someone else needs you know those layers to be named or not but i don't really default to naming layers I don't know if we're going to get in trouble for actually confessing that we don't name all our layers, um, but it's, it's the reality of the situation, so this is a cool one to check out. Next up is Recap, where we review content from industry events and talks and conferences. So Adobe just had their Adobe Max conference. It's kind of a big deal in the Adobe world. Um, it was really interesting for me to watch you know, pieces of this because Adobe has a lot of rivals right now. They have a lot of companies that are trying to grab their customer base, um, including Canva, which is just getting bigger and bigger and introducing more and more tools. Um, and I would guess that Canva is one of the major reasons that Adobe actually bought Figma. Yeah, you can hear it in some of the things they're talking about, right? Um, I, I, I saw some other takes on the conference as well, mentioning that um, like Figma and Fig Jam might actually be kind of an uh, point of entry to product teams and non-product teams. Um, and, and there's just kind of an interesting opportunity here for Adobe to start playing in the whiteboarding space as well with Fig Jam. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they go head to head with some of those competitors. They had Dylan Field on as well, who was the CEO and um, 
you know, probably trying to show some of the good relationship there and, and uh, you know, kind of smooth over some of the wrinkles from that announcement. And uh, he made kind of one of the main big announcements of the first Adobe feature coming to Figma, which is fonts um, from, uh, from Adobe Fonts. They showed a bunch of really cool AI experiments they've been running lately. So you can project 2D designs onto 3D surfaces. You can edit videos and add assets to them using AI. You can kind of fuse shapes onto typography. You can use AI to composite images. You can make videos searchable. You can even add missing environment around a photo. So all of this stuff with AI is really interesting for us as product designers, but it was just really cool to watch Adobe and these experiments that they put out there. So definitely worth a watch. We will put a couple links to recaps and more information about Adobe Max in the show notes. Last up is rapid fire, where we run through a quick list of click-worthy items. So first one is randoma11y.com, which just gives you a generator for creating color palettes that are accessible, that are that have the right color contrast. Um, they have some really nice color palettes, palettes actually, and they give you a couple tools for making accessible ones. So I think that's a great tool to utilize. Yeah, and they actually look pretty good, reminding us that accessibility doesn't have to be ugly. Another one we found is Overflow Stories. Um, Overflow Stories is this really cool feature that Overflow.io has implemented. If you've if you've heard of them, they make user flows, um, and this is a way to annotate user flows so that someone viewing it can actually move through it, and you can like annotate it and give them little tips and things to to basically do like a design handoff or a design presentation without having to be there. Um, or I suppose you could be there. But it's a really nice way to move through a design file. Uh, honestly, I would love to see this in some other tools. So it's a good one to check out. And the last one is the State of Design Ops 2022 report. So they did a survey of 444 design ops professionals from about 45 countries. And just he here's a couple of the main highlights from what they found. First of all, it's design ops is being adopted across the globe. Like we said, 45 countries. So that's a pretty widespread. They found that the majority of professionals identify as female, which is really interesting. It's definitely maturing the field of design ops in general because there's a lot more adoption amongst more companies. The average time to stand up a design ops team is one to two years. The average design to design ops ratio is 25 to one. Yeah, I think the ratio of 25 to one is actually really interesting. That's like 25 designers before you hire a design ops person or like convert a designer to a design ops person. I'd love to hear from some of the design ops people in our audience. In my experience, that's when my team started thinking about design ops. That's when you kind of get big enough that it's kind of hard to manage everything that's going on on a team and, and it helps to have design ops. So I'd love to hear what our audience thinks of that, that ratio and what they think might work better. So we'll put a link to that report in the show notes and be sure to check it out. That's it for this episode of the Product Design Report. Thanks for joining us. We got a lot of great feedback from our first episode and we made several improvements. We hope you like them. Be sure to keep the feedback coming so that we can make something that you enjoy and benefit from. Also, if you find something interesting during the week that you think we should cover in a future episode, feel free to send it over and let us know. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Experiments that they're run. <laughs> Just a second. Next up is rapid fire, where we run through a quick list of quick worthy items. A click list of quick worthy items. <laughs> yeah. Is that fine? Next up is rapid fire, where we run through a quick list of click. 